YouTube. And I do have a couple quick announcements before we get started. Um, the first announcement is that Nina Burkhart, Hart, I'm sorry, Nina Burkhart, who is our foray chair, she had a very successful like and walk this last weekend with um, some members and she wants to do it again in May, but she's looking for a new place somewhere in the middle of the state, middle of New Jersey. Um, so she asked me if I would, uh, you know, throw that out there. If anybody has any ideas, some, somewhere in the mid-state area, last week they were in South Jersey. Um, she's looking for somewhere that has at least some, some lichens, somewhere that people have observed some lichens and somewhere that has parking for 12 to 15 cars, that's important. Um, so if anybody has any ideas, I did put, um, I put her email address in the chat. You can give it to her directly. Or if you, like I see somebody typed in something now tonight already, thank you, Bianca. I'll pass them on to her. My second announcement is that we had an executive committee meeting last night, which sounds, you know, super important and prestigious, but I assure you it's not that. It was just the, uh, the officers and the, uh, the uh, uh, board for NJMA getting together and discussing some, big, you know, some business materials that we just have to do to run a club that's almost 500 people strong. And one of the things we were talking about last night is uh, trying to is inviting other people to join us for that kind of stuff. So I know there's some people here who have uh, become, you know, really regular active members over the past year or maybe longer. Um, I know I've gotten to know some of you over the past year. Um, if anybody's interested and doing more with the club. We would love to have uh, people, we have all kinds of volunteer opportunities, whether it's outreach, um, you know, stuff that we do at the forays, assisting with forays, assisting with the taxonomy Tuesday, all kinds of different things. And you certainly do not need to be a mushroom expert to get involved. All you have to do is kind of be passionate about mushrooms and we'll find stuff for you to do. So if anybody wants to um, get more involved, I would ask that you just email me back here at my email address, which is what the taxonomy Tuesday announcements are. Um, and um, let me know and I'll pass the information on to our president, Frank. All right. Um, so with all that being said, I think we're ready to get started. So um, I think I went over everything. So is there anybody that wants to go first or should I go right to my emails and start showing that stuff off? Anybody have anything they wanna get started with? Okay, I'm going to go right into uh, sharing my screen. I only have a couple of things here to start with. I do have some emails from some other people. Marisol, why don't you get started, okay? Okay. So here's your first one. I'll pause when it opens up so everyone can see the name before I start sharing the photographs. So, Pinu Forella Cutulifera. <coughs> okay. Oh. Something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we never know. Mm. Okay, so I didn't find any gill mushrooms at all. Not even as for my seeds, but I keep finding the crusts. And I found cool ones this last Saturday. I found two uh, penioforelas and one fanero caete and the microscopic features features are beautiful and I am um, some I identify by myself and some I identify by with help of other people and some of these ones that I found they seem to be uh, belonging in a complex in a complex in a group so uh, so this one is penioforella gutulifera group or complex uh, however you whatever you like to call it. And the, the species name Gutulifera is because 
it has cystidia that exudes some matter through the tips. And we're going to see that on the photos. So this, the cross looks like what you're seeing some kind of very thin uh, fruit, fruiting body. Go ahead, can you please show the microscopic features? No, that's the same one. In all of these things that I found are on deciduous rotten wood, decorticated and rotten. So those are the spores. Nothing special about the spores. And this one has several types of cystidia. So you can see the, the cystidia right there has some kind of capitate end and it has very fine crystals, but I couldn't focus the whole thing. It, it wouldn't, it wouldn't focus right. But at the tip, it has crystals. I measured all these things and I put all the, the measurements in the, in the observation in iNaturalist. And it has this huge, this is a second type of cystidia, like inflated. And this is the one that breaks at the tip is pointy. It breaks at the tip and it exudes, exudes this matter. Can you show the other photos, please? Oh, that's the basidia. It has four serimata. <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's very long. This one um, is a photo to show you the, the dark areas are crystals that were at the, top, at the end of the inflated cystidia, the one that exudes that matter. This scale is like uh, or maybe 100 X. Okay, yeah. Can you move? go red for a stain? Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I have another photo here of the, the crystals that are at the end of that cystidia. Can you show the other ones? Um, no, that photo's not good. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wait, no, no, this is good. This is good, the next one. So here you can see in the sides of the one that is ruptured, two that are good. They have some points. And I'm sorry that the picture is so tiny, but at the tip of each of them, there is the matter starting to come out. And the one in the middle that has that gigantic drop backwards broke. So the, the matter spread neatly around it and the tip of the cystidia is there on the top of that drop. So the, the species name comes from that gutulifera, like gutation, like drops. Can you show the photos please? This is another type of cystidia. This one has like three or four types of cystidia. I found two or three like this. It's capitate has a round capitate end. That's it, that's all I can tell you. Oh, and there is one pointy below it. You can see it, it's darker. The pointy one that will rupture. All right. Show the next photo, please. And here, oh, I wrote that in there. Although it's very tiny, you can see that there is something starting to come out. Uh, this is just to show that there are clams. I only saw that one, but that's good enough to show that I saw them. It's on the lower left. And um, that spore below it is a stranger. It's from another uh, uh, fruiting body that I found. And here is the cystida with the pointy, pointy ends. And in the side, in the left, to the left, is the one with the crystals covering the tips. All right, I think it's all your pictures for that one. All right. Okay, Pineophorella pubera. All right, uh, so this one has, um, when you look at it with the lens, you can see that there is an exerted, <laughs> thank you, cystidia, but then you have to look how it looks in the microscope. It's another like 
no great look, no great aspect of the crust on rotten deciduous wood. But then when you look at the microscopic features, that's when the thing is so beautiful. Can you pass, please? Maricel, I wanted to ask, how do you collect the sample from this? Would you scrape it I, off? I have um, paper envelopes and I just cut a little sample, like an inch long, so I could get the spore print. And it's just like a little thin piece of fruiting body. So there is not even a problem to dry them. So I put them in the envelope upside down. When I come home, I put them on a slide and the next day I get the spore print. Yeah, and the previous day I work on the microscopic features. But you can work on cross fungi when they are dry with no problem. So it's not a problem if it is fresh or it's dry. Okay, so this one has exerted Lamprocystidia, which means like a, oh, this one has the other feature. I forgot about that. I wrote the name in there because it's a, a weird name, Estefanocyst. It's like some globose type of cystidia scattered around. Okay. And this is the Lamprocystidia, which is pointy cystidia with crystals that are covering the whole thing. The, the part that is exerted and the walls are thick. And I don't know if this is just by accident that something was behind it or it was an excretion. I, I don't know what it was. Okay. Oh, the halo on that yes, the halo. Top one. Yes. <laughs> I, I still don't know if it was by accident that something was behind it or it was exuding that. Here is like 100X to show you how many Lamprocystidia are on the crust. Now, isn't this why they call it pubera? Because these are so big that you can, it actually looks yes. pubescent. Like, uh huh, uh huh, yeah. Yeah, when you actually look at it really closely, it looks like little hairs projecting mm -hmm. out of this crust. Yep. Mm -hmm. Because of these things. That's a good picture. Oh, I put it twice. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, here I got this this one. So you can see the crystals and you can see the thick walls. And if you go towards the base, which is uh, inside the flesh uh, with the basidia, like in a row, a palisade of basidia, and this thing just sticks out. And if, towards the bottom, I got another photo. I couldn't fit it in the image. I cannot rotate the image in this uh, new uh, microscope, so I took the photo of the tip and then a photo of the base. So it kind of enlarges towards the base, but at, below the base is a narrow strip of hypha. Again, that it goes inside the flesh. More, more lamprocystidia. More. And this is the basidia, and it has a clamp at the base. And it's very long towards the bottom and um, wider towards the top. Mm -hmm. And those are the spores. More spores. And that's it. Uh, Maricel, when you put the thing down on the slide, do you cover that overnight with a dish or anything? Oh, nothing. I put it back in the envelope. Oh, okay, right. Yeah, put it back in the envelope. Yeah, right, right. That makes sense. To mm -hmm. capture it so it doesn't fly all over. Yeah. I'm going to um, stop real quick for a second, Marisol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm trying to help somebody get onto the mm -hmm. body here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm distracted. I'm sorry. Somebody's emailing me trying to figure out how to get on. Mm -hmm. No hay problema. I just would like to, to add a, a statement. Sometimes we see green plants in the morning and you think they're covered with in certain areas with little drops of dew, but it's not. Uh, certain plants have what they call water agutation. That's the word that Maricel used uh, for that first uh, 
species that she was talking about, guttation. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of neat. Sometimes you can get some beautiful photographs uh, because the little tiny water droplets uh, released by the uh, little openings in the green leaf uh, are all very symmetrical. Hmm. Do you know which kind of plants, like one example? Uh, no, I can't find it out, don't worry about that. Yeah, I will, I, I'm imaging something in my mind, but I can't remember <laughs> the name. <laughs> I, I never heard about that, that some plants do it, yeah. I was surprised to see, um, oh dear, what's the name of it? Oh, I'll come back in a second. Okay. Oh. I, I'm back. So, okay. so this is Phenericate Cerdida complex. Okay. And mm -hmm. in, in Nine Naturalists, yeah. like they're calling it Phenericitaceae. Yep. Fam family. Yeah, because I didn't get somebody to second me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, this was a very small fruiting body, it's very thin. And when I look at the micro, um, the first microscope, to see the bigger features, I couldn't see anything sticking out. And when I did the microscopic of it, I was like, wow, I couldn't, I, at this moment, I didn't have the spore print, but I wanted to show one spore just for the type. It's small. I have a spore print, or I think I didn't get the spore print. So it has this beautiful cystidia and only the end has this crystals. It was really beautiful. You can see that it's exerted beyond the basidia. Mm, and I never saw anything like that. And underneath in the hymenion is the fertile part. So hymenion is below the, the hymenion and then the subiculum is the one that attaches the cross to the wood. So in that subiculum, the one that attaches the cross to the wood is made out of hifa with crystals. I have photos, it's beautiful. And the walls are very thick. You see that too. Can you show the other photos? That's just, no. You can see some crystals uh, outside the hifa and some septa. The walls are thick, but the septa, the septa was really thin. The that right there. Yes, it was really thin. Yeah, you can even see there. And these ones are. One was broken, but I, I couldn't focus that better. So I just wanted to show you. And here, mm, some other one that is just starting to push, to be exerted with some crystals, really kind of dark crystals for being white. They look dark in there. Mm. Yeah, another one, it's just on the tip. I put some Congo to show the walls and it showed. And here is the Haifa or Hifa that is below it in the, yeah, Sudhaminion and Subiculum. And I sent this uh, photo to uh, Karen, the Karen, oh, what's her name? Karen Nakasoni. Nakasoni. And she told me the, it's a, Fanerokaete uh, sordida complex. And she said that not, there is not too much information about it, but it's good enough, close enough. Yeah, so you can see the hifa with the incrustations on the top. And it just looks like a white, simple, small fruiting body on rotten, decorticated, deciduous wood. Like melted marshmallow. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hyphodacha or Guta. Or Guta. That's another fun um, uh, cross. I have found it many times before. It was super tiny. I don't think there is even an inch big. But I noticed when I found the teeth, I found the cross with the teeth, um, it's bigger and it was close to this one. And then I did the microscopic of the Hippodontia arcuta and it has two types of cystidia you're going to see. One is called halocystidia. 
Can you show the micro, please? Oh, the spores. And it has la genocystidia, which is this drill-like cystidia. There are few on this photo. You can point and opposite to it. Opposite and one of, ab, above to the left, near the clamp. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That's called la genocystidia. They call it a dental drill. That's to make people picture that. So that is one part of Hippodontia arguta. And the other one is called halocystidia. I tried to, I, get a, I got a better photo, but I just wanted to show you how funny the other uh, cystidia is. That one has one tip. That's the halo cystidia. And sometimes it has a, a halo, a, a, like a concentration of some matter there. That's why it's called halo cystidia. And when it doesn't have the, the halo, it is capitate. Oh, the halo is right there on the one on the left. Actually, there are three, but I couldn't focus better than that. The lagenocystidia towards the left. And more lagenocystidia. The lago, like or cystidia, are the really sharp ones? Let's see. L A G E. I don't know how to say lagenocystidia or laginocystidia. I don't know. Yeah. And did you get to um, Arguta because of those two specific cystidia oh, in yeah. combination? <laughs> Uh huh. Arguta has these two combined because there are several uh, hypodontias, but they have a combination of different um, cystidia and size of the halocystidia. One has gigantic halocystidia. Uh, it has clams, so I wanted to show that. Okay. What's the name when the hypha is joining another hypha that is close to it? I don't know. Hey. I forgot the name, but it's happening right there on the lower part of the hifa. Uh huh. They just connect it. Mm -hmm. oh, I forgot. Okay, more more of the halo cystidia. That's it. Mm -hmm. It's very attractive. Yeah. It's funny because that looks like it looks so much like some of those other like those mycoaceas, doesn't it? Uh, but I, I'm not talking about the one with the teeth. It's the little one with the white. Oh, there. It, that's the one. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. sorry. I thought that was just an immature part of that oh, one. No, no, no. But I couldn't take a photo without taking that thing. Yeah. Okay, so that probably is Michael Asia up there or something yeah, like that. Yeah, I didn't get my hands on that one yet. <laughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this one is. That's the one. It's super tiny. So are these like teeth? Or are they more like warts? It, it's like warts, teeth, granules, something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Super that. tiny. Yeah, yeah. So did, Maricel, did you scrape like a bit of this in order to do the microscopy? I have a special knife that has a blunt end. It has a lateral regular edge, but it has on the front a, a diagonal edge. I push it and it takes the wood like a slice. Cool. I always go under to, yeah. If I scrape it, it's, it's pretty bad. But sometimes I had to do that. Usually, because the wood is so rotten, I can take a piece, a slice. All right, cool. Okay. And one more. Oh, cool, Hypomyces aurantius. So this one was growing on top of, it was parasitizing, I think, a polypore. And it's made out of orange, I don't know the right, names orange like packs if anybody knows the name please tell me because i don't know it and they are on a orange subiculum held on that orange subiculum so i did the micro of both and the spores are beautiful and huge they're pointing towards the ends and they have drops as you can see there i couldn't get good good photos that's all I could, because it was kind of gelatinous, and this is the hifa from the subiculum, what holds this uh, packs like onto the polypore. And that's the, the real color, that's in water. 
That's more of the hifa. And that's it. All right. Okay. Very nice. Oh, thank you, Marisol. It was always very nice stuff. Thank you. Okay. So who is next? Uh, how about Dorothy? Are you ready to go, Dorothy? Okay. Um, I was on the the lichen of foray, um, and this is uh, what they call uh, the lipstick powder horn. And you know, some people think all of the little red um, topped lichens are British soldiers, but but they're not. There's quite a few of them and you have to look at the sides of the uh, stalk, which is called a podetium. And these little red structures are the apothecia. Um, and uh, this is uh, Clodonia massalenta. Can everyone see that name that's right there? I don't know if it shows up on your screen or just me. I see it. You can see it? Okay, good. Yes. All right. Ready for the next one, Dorothy? So these were at uh, all at Franklin uh, Parker Preserve uh, that Nina and John have been doing, a, a running a, a survey of um, the fungi there uh, for many years now. And next. <laughs> Ah, uh, you know, I don't have, you know, any particular order here, but th this is the concrete wall, but actually you want to zoom into these. The little yellow bumps here in the concrete uh, wall at Franklin Parker, uh, that's probably a caloplaca, a kind of crustose lichen, but these uh, little apothecia here in the bottom left, maybe you can zoom out and just I guess these. Yeah, um, they they are an endolithic lichen. So what does that mean? That means that the the hyphae, the thallus, are actually below the level of the surface of the concrete, and the only thing that comes up to be visible is uh, the these apothecia or these little pie tarts just like a cup fungus, uh, you know, and, um, and most of you know what that is. So uh, endolithic means below the stone um, and it's Myriolechus dispersa uh, is the name of it. And of course I had no idea, but Dennis Waters who was on the lichen foray with Jason and Liz, um, he found them and identified them. Uh, he has done a checklist of the lichens, New Jersey lichens of Mercer County, and right now is working on Hunterdon County. So it's really cool. So, you know, there's all kinds of fun things to think about with lichens. Uh, next. Dorothy, what's the name of the previous one? M Y. R I O, Mirio L E C I S. Okay. Dispersa. Okay. And this one, Pycnothelia papillaria, is um, a, a, it's called a nipple lichen, or the other name for it I, I just looked up was gnome fingers, G N O M E <laughs> fingers. Um, it's in the Cladonia family. So your, um, your reindeer lichen, which is not a moss, by the way, is a, is a kind of Cladonia. And, and this is actually right on the soil. And it was against the railroad tracks if, if you were ever at uh, Franklin Parker Preserve. But it's, it's extremely tiny. I actually used a took the picture with the hand lens on top of it to get this image. So I, I found this, I had no idea what it was. Dennis named it, 
uh, but it, it it's a really cool little thing. So it's it's a fruticose lichen growing right on the soil. Dorothy, I found this one in Chatsworth in the cemetery. Ah, okay. The ground in the cemetery when I used to like lichens. Yep. Yeah, it, it has a wide oh, range mm -hmm. um, from all the southern states up into New England, uh, but it's becoming rare in Canada. Next. I think that might have been it, Dorothy. Oh, the first one. Oh, sorry. Oh, cool one. Um, so this is a, <laughs> a sterium fungus and I'll show you in a second with uh, holding the actual specimen up. Um, Nina and John knew what this was. Uh, they, when they had invited Tim Baroni to Franklin Parker Preserve, they found this. It's on a skinny twig, and you can tell that that black twig had been burnt. Um, and it's a very, very hairy capped uh, sterium yellow underneath. Uh, it might be also a complex and um, its name is Sterium ocracio flavum. Flavum, flava means yellow and that's the color of the stuff underneath. Um, Timberoni uh, brought it back, looked at it and but couldn't find any spores. So he's very interested in looking at the size of the spores. So I'm, I'm going to have to play with my specimen, maybe. But uh, thanks to John and Nina, we we have uh, the name for it. You so if we go back to the um, image, I'll I'll put my video on. <laughs> and again, I don't. I can you see this is the stick. Yeah, now speak again, Dorothy. Oh, um, if you can see, this is the stick I'm holding up. Um, yeah, hold it still. Yeah, hold it still. Thank you. It's very, very, it's very, very skinny. I mean, my fi look how fat my finger is. So these are very, very tiny things. You can't see their fuzzy um, caps, um, but that's another species of, of sterium. When I checked it out on um, um, online, it said that it was a pathogen of, of peach trees, but that might be something similar to it. Um, definitely it was uh, on the burnt twigs that there, there had been a, a fire at Franklin Parker at one point. So it's only on these tiny twigs that have been burnt uh, that Nina and John have noticed them. So that's all I have. <laughs> those were those were fresh. They're sterium from the spring, not overwintered. That's a good question. I, I, it's hard to say. Hmm. It, they, they could have been last winter. Okay, hmm, very cool. And can I tell you something? We find it all the time in Franklin Parker. That's where I was. <laughs> on oak, on little twigs of, of burnt oak. Yeah, it's very common. And, and we find it throughout different seasons. So I wonder though, has anybody ever actually seen that anywhere besides Franklin Parker? Because I haven't. Uh, say that again, what? Has anyone ever seen that anywhere besides Franklin Parker? Because I've never seen it anywhere else in the uh, pine barrens. I, in all my years, I've never seen it before. I always find it in Franklin Parker in different okay. areas, but I cannot recall in other areas. Yep. Okay. Yeah, it seems like it's pretty uncommon. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is a known species because I think Rivarden has it in his steroid fungi of North America. So it is described in there too, but that's the only place I've ever seen it is in Franklin Parker. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. All right. Well, cool. Thank you, Dorothy. Let's see who is next. Ah, Susan Hopkins. 
Great. Is this one good? Is this the first one you want to do? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Because I'll talk too much about my sarcosomas. <laughs> this, these I just took today. This is uh, brand new. It's not even got the insect boring in at the bottom. They're very fresh. It's Cryptoporus bulvatus, and it's a little polypore, these little popcorn-like things. The pores have hardly even developed on the one that's split in half. But Luke, you can use the, the uh, pointer, Joe, that at the bottom, the pores are the upper half or will develop into the pores. And then at the very bottom, the insect will bore in. And um, as the thing makes its spores, that the insect eats the spores and takes them away. But it's totally enclosed at this point in time. And I've been looking for this because it is actually fairly common here. Um, and it's on either red pine or um, scotch pine. This, I think, was a dead red pine. And usually what happens is the people along the road, which this was a major highway, cut the tree down before the next year. But anyway, I see it kind of often, but I rarely catch it when it's this fresh. Um, they tend to go a little bit yellower, beiger, as they age. Sue, so how big is this? Um, those are about, well, I can show you, actually, because, here, can you see? You, I think you muted yourself, Sue. Sorry, not sure how that happened. There they are. Okay, so they're a little bit bigger than the end of my thumb. This this is the, wow. the, the same thing. Oh, wait, wait. Huh. I yeah, it, it's I hard to tell in the picture. No, I, yeah. It was the side of the road. I was trying to get to lunch and I would, the sun was directly on the, the tree. So I had to sort of hold my arm in a glove to, to picture so that it wasn't overexposed from the sunlight. Here, here is the thing. Yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah, they're really cool. And uh, they look like popcorn on the tree. And I know for a fact that it was not there last Wednesday a week ago. So they've come out just, we had six inches of snow last week. And uh, it's, it melted very quickly, but then we had some more rain. And I know that was enough, must have triggered enough to come up through the tree to uh, have these to fruit out. They're really neat little mushroom. We used to see them in peak, Dorothy, years ago on the red pines. Although even though we were there at the end of June, they hang around for a long time. Sometimes over a year, they'll be still on the tree. All right. Very nice. Yeah, they're really cool. Right, this is the Plectania species. Uh, this is the little black cup fungus. I'm not clever enough to uh, do microscope with something like this, and also to have a key. Uh, it, it, you know, you got to have the right material. Um, but they're just little black crops that I saw them in three or four places in the, over this last week, but this was one of my sarcosoma sites, and it was right on the path. But because they're so black, um, I usually spot them. And you can see with the quarter how big they are. And they only come out in the spring, I think. Susan, what's the name of the black ones? Uh, Plectania uh, species. I don't know the species. Okay. Can you, see it? Can you see it right there, Marcel? No, I don't see it. Don't see I, I see it. It's uh, too tiny. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, are they a northern species? Because I've never seen them in New Jersey. Uh, it's possible that they may be with the conifers or specifically here with the spruce. Oh, okay. Could be the case. Um, for my immediate area in the, about a 25 mile radius, I have mostly conifers. I have no oaks except some planted ones in town. And beech, yeah. birch. Looks like pine needles. 
Yeah, the, yeah, it's probably the um, white pine as well as the spruce needles. Mm -hmm. uh, my guess. Very neat. Yes, yeah, I see them every year. I finally made the effort to take a, a fairly good picture. Now this, I believe, is strobula, strobularius, strobularis esculentus. These are, um, after you guys said something last week, I tried to make the association with the um, Norway spruce cones. When I saw quite a few of these today, I did not pick up the cones to see if they were actually attached, but there, the whole area is, is Norway spruce. So, you know, it could be old rotting spruce in the ground that the uh, cones that are what these things could be on. But here I tried to get a good picture of it so you can see. It's just a little tiny thing, but comes up in little bunches all around these rotting cones. So that's kind of fun for me to actually, you know, the one thing about this Tuesday session, it's helping me remember some of these things I see when either you or somebody suggests a name to research it and also try and remember it. And this one may be after five years now that I've been looking at it. I might remember. It's also a thing I've only I only see it in the spring, and there's no other gilt mushrooms out at this point in time. Doesn't esculentus mean delicious? Yeah, I want. I don't know where that name comes from. Uh, um, yeah, you have to pick an awful lot of these things. <laughs> well, if that's the thing, I don't know who named it and why they gave it that name, but that would be interesting to pursue. Yeah. But they're not. I mean, they're not even. You know, they're not even as big as my thumbnail, although that one on the on the right maybe is about oh three quarters of an inch across. But you can see how tiny they are when they're coming up. Again, we had a lot of rain in the snow last week, so a lot of moisture in the ground. Wow, snow. Um, so what is the deal with that upper left hand leaf that is has green areas and dark areas? Looks like a plantain to me. Uh, it might be a last year's bunch, uh, bunchberry leaf. Bunchberry is kind of common up here along the trails. Well, look at this pine needle that's on there. Look at the black dots. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. These guys are going to make me really bend over and look at stuff. <laughs> they were, they're in the, um, the, the midwinter edition of Fungi Magazine, which actually just came in the mail for me. Um, okay. there, there is an article, Larry Millman's thing. He does a Small Wonders. And he had a uh, a black dot on here, something with a uh, it has like a little split in it. So it's in that um, Hysterocades, I think it's called, something like that. Another mushroom I saw today, but I don't, I couldn't photograph it because it was only about a quarter of an inch across. Was uh, Callocypha fulgens, but because it's a bright, bright buttercup yellow, um, and there was two little, two little cups. I knew I couldn't get a picture with my phone of that. Um, I have seen it in years past in this same general area, um, but I, I, you know, I would love to show you that. So I'm going to look for it next week, see if it's come out. It's got to be really cold and wet, but really wet for this to come out. And it's another thing that only comes out in the spring. But and now you'll have to, I'll have to start looking at black dots, huh? On pine needles. Well, you know, it was funny because I read that just the other day and then I went out and I picked up a handful of pine needles and there were little black dots all over it. And but of course, I didn't have a magnifying glass with me and I couldn't really see them very well. But. Well, I have um, I have attached my um, hand lens to my backpack. So, I, yeah, I could look at these things. Don't ever go anywhere without your lens. Yeah, Come I on. Know. I know. I was mad at <laughs> I was mad at myself. At the beginning of the season, I don't. But now, the, I was with the Paul Smith students. They've started the club up again. And I have found that, you know, I, I really like them to look at little stuff. All right. Now, here's my, my nightly, my uh, weekly sarcosoma report. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's eight in this picture. Oh, wait. One, two, three. Beautiful. Six, seven, eight. Um, this is... The one down in the lower left is the same one I showed you last week, only bigger yet again. And these others, the three in the middle, I think I showed last week. 
They haven't changed an awful lot, but they have swelled up a little bit. Now, when I took this picture, these were pretty much frozen, okay? And because it's only about 10 feet from the path, when I came back out of the woods about two and a half hours later, um, they were all thawed out, or almost all thawed out. They were soft. They were squidgy. And um, they're just the coolest little things. I, I Well, I picked up three that um, had been tipped by animals or otherwise disturbed. Um, but they, for the most part, are not doing their spores yet. I was hoping Igor would be on uh, on board tonight because I he kind of wants one for the herbarium. And um, I don't know if, well, go, show all the pictures and then you can show me because I, I actually have one of them here that I can show you. But now this group here, this was on my site four and these were mostly covered by leaves. I did not see these last week. But between most of these sites, they've almost doubled in their individual um, fruiting bodies, because that's what I do. I don't pick them, but I go through the little areas and count them. And this little foursome I did not see at all last week, but then they were under leaves a little bit. That's why I think they're a little blonde around the upper cap and being swollen up uh, from the uh, rain and the snow. To growth. And this, this is more typically what they look like when um, I first see them or watch them grow. They're that very black disc in the middle and then the very wrinkled um, skin as it sort of swells up with the water or shrinks down if it dries up a little bit. But this, these were all taken today. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a, they're such a cute little thing. And I'll show you the ones that uh, uh, were tipped. Yeah, okay, so these two here, the one on the left is, is growing, whereas the one on the right, I have right here because it was tipped by the animals. And um, well, when Luke sort of stops this, you can probably see it better. Um, and I own, uh, well, this week, cause I wasn't gonna take them for the, um, for the spores yet. I, own, I take the ones only that um, the animals have tipped up. I don't know if you can make this bigger on your screens or whatever to be able to see this thing. But it's squidgy, it's soft, it's it's like a jello shot. That's what I call it. A little jello shot. But you can see what the size of it is too. This is the one we just saw that was on the right. And then there's I have another couple here that here's one where the, the animals ate out the black um, disc in the middle but much the same size. And then there's another one that probably got tipped a few days ago and it's a little shriveled up, so it's not gonna grow anymore, but it's also been nibbled at the top. So they're spreading the spores, those animals that eat the middle. I think that's true, but I also think that they particularly like the moisture when it's dry. Um, that particular area isn't near any water source other than um, you know, what dew forms overnight from um, normal condensation on things. But so I why not, So why not eat the whole thing? Well, little red squirrels. Maybe they don't want the whole thing. But what's it observed this year is they only seem to eat out the black disc part. Very often leave the rest. Yeah. Well, that, that's the spore content, right? Maybe they don't yeah. like the, the, the spores are other forming. stuff. Yeah, if the spores are forming, but that may be an evolutionary thing that they've they've developed the, the thing to eat the spore bearing area to be able to carry it somewhere else as another form of getting the spores out besides the usual. I expect, well, I didn't show any pictures yet, but they're starting starting to flatten out a little bit. This black disc becomes bigger and then if it, uh, it throws the spores maybe next week and the week after, um, and I will pick one then. And that's why I wanted Igor to see if he wanted one fresh or dried or what. Um, the only way I can dry these is in the refrigerator for weeks and weeks in a wax bag. You, you can't put it in a food dehydrator. You'd have to run for a week. They're, 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 just, solid, they're just solid water inside of here. <coughs> Gray, 
Yellow mat. Susan, did you have a chance to read that information I Google translated for you from Russian you sources? Said. Yes, I read what you sent. Yeah, that somebody really wants to investigate the uh, medicinal uh, properties of that gray flesh. Yes. They do believe that that liquid inside has rejuvenating properties. And in the villages, they collect a lot of these mushrooms and they kind of put that liquid on their faces, on their on their skin, on hands, and they say it feels, it, it's just beautiful. The skin is becoming beautiful. You have an access to it. Please try and show us your face in, next uh, week, how much younger you look. Like I say, I don't really pick them unless the animals tip them over, uh, which this particular one happened to be whole, you know, no nibbling and otherwise. Um, but it, since Igor wants one um, for the spores, and like I said, when I can be pretty sure the spores are coming out, I will pick one that I uh, and bring it home and maybe get out my microscope to look at it. Um, but they are. They People collect them a lot and they make remed all kinds of remedies from them. They are believed to have medicinal properties. Well, but remedies for what though? I'm not sure I have to read to read more precisely about that, but that um, Russian mycologist, Michael Vishnevsky, he says it needs to be investigated more. Oh, I'll bet. But if it's yeah. a rare mushroom, that's a little tricky to do, but that, mm, that's- Not that rare. It just, uh, uh, it used to be more to the north of Russia. And for some reason, maybe because the climate is changing, it moved more to the south. They can find like, it was rare there, and now it's it's prolific. It's everywhere. Oh, he likes it better. And people preserve it and make some kind of home remedy, home medicine. I don't remember what for, but they, they do believe that it has medicinal properties. Mm -hmm. But it's folk belief. Igor said uh, last week or the week before that 12 European countries are listing it as rare. In fact, I actually noticed on my iNaturalist posts that if you look up the location of where I took the pictures, it won't give it because it is listed as rare. It will uh -huh. give maybe the general area of Lake Placid, but it won't give you a specific location, which I thought was kind of interesting. I watch a lot of Russian uh, YouTube videos, you know, still, about that mushroom. Uh, yeah. I will still uh -huh. for the next two or three weeks or more, as long as they're out there. Yeah, that's interesting that INAT puts puts the uh, obscuring on it, only on special things. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That is interesting. Well, Susan, when you, when you, for example, if you were to cut it in half, I'm not asking you to do it, but if you were, would it like spill out or would yes. it be, just, no, okay. Yes, yes, it would. Oh, it would, okay. Yeah, it it. If I did that here, it would it would squidge all over this tray, and be liquid gray jello all over. This this is somewhat well. You can almost see here. It, it, like aloe vera, right? I think the only reason it's not squidging out is because it's dried a, a little surface here uh, on the top of the black, just underneath where the uh, disc would be. But if I if I really tore this, I mean you can see it, it's it's very squidgy. They're a lot of fun. Cool. That's it. Well, thank you. Thank you. So okay, it's uh, eight o'clock now. So before we keep sharing, I wanted to check in to see. I have um I know I have Virginia, Dave, myself, and then Lila said she has something to share. Is there anybody else that joined us? I know a lot of people joined us. I just wanted to uh, check in. I, the mushroom from last week, the blue one that I found on the tree, uh, I posted it like we, like you suggested, and I have a, a name potentially for it, but I'll, I can talk about that later. Okay, so you'll show us that. Okay, is there anybody else that has anything that they want to share? Okay, cool. Then I'm going to go back into my share screen. And it looks like Virginia's next. Hi, Virginia. Okay. Um, I have uh, two uh, slime molds. 
Okay, uh, this is from the foray at the uh, Horseshoe Bend Park last September, and I collected leaf litter, and this is what um, showed up. Uh, this looks something like Parakeena depressa, but it's more puffy, it's pulvinate. So it's a different species, which um, I, uh, I deed it to uh, Parakeena quadrata, quadrata, which seems to be not very common at all. Um, I, there might be another uh, picture there of the spores. Oh, another picture that shows how, how puffy it is, pulvinate. And then another one of the, the spores and the capillitium. Okay, so on, on GBIF, it only seems to be, there are a lot like in the southwestern part of the country and maybe Ohio or somewhere. And on iNaturalist, there was only one from Australia. So it doesn't seem to be very common but it could be that people are misidentifying parakeena depressa. And it made me think I should go back and look at my parakeena depressa and make sure I have them all, you know, done correctly. Virginia, is this a, a stain on them or is this the natural color? That's the natural color. They are, the, the spore mass is kind of um, golden yellow and those spores are yellow. The, the um, peridium, the outside is um, darkish brown and it has, a, you can see uh, along the edge, um, it will be where the top will split off. It's a little paler color on the, on the sporangia. That's where it's going to split and the top um, peridium will come off. And they're not, with the parakeena depressa, uh, depressa is, will more likely lose its, um, it'll be his, whatever, the top will come off more quickly, whereas these do not. Okay, so that's that one. And this is from the foray at, uh, in Hunterton County at um, Worshipen uh, Park. Now, when I was taking those, this last one off, uh, getting the leaves out of my container, I turned one of the leaves over and there was another one. There was this um, hematrichia serpula underneath, which I didn't see at first, but um, this one I guess is more common. I didn't really check how many there are in New Jersey, but uh, it's, I've seen it many other places. Um, and if you look at the next, um, uh, this is the spore. Um, the spores are sort of reticulate. And uh, the next picture after that, I think, will show the reticulate spores and kind of like a band around the edge. I guess that's bec because of the reticulations is the way it looks. And the capillitium has spines on it. And that's another characteristic. <clears throat> so those are two new ones from um, Horseshoe Bend Park. Okay, so that's it. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So you collected this leaf litter. In September. Yeah, uh, so. I didn't do the, um, the moist cultures until October, I guess. Um, and then maybe they got set aside because I was, I think it was maybe January or February where I noticed that they had fruited. So, and, you know, they're okay as long as they're dry, they'll, you know, if you take the lid off and, uh, and as long as they're dry, they'll sit there, they, they won't, nothing will happen to them. So I just got ar around to um, looking at them this last week. Virginia, may I ask you a question? Yes. One time I collected a lot of uh, pieces of bark and I wet them, but then I only got like one or two things because the rest of the wood, it got hypomysis. How do you keep it from getting that? What is this moist chamber? What, I how do you do it? Uh, there's no way I can keep it from doing that because they have to stay moist. Yeah, but them, you keep them enclosed? They have to be closed. Well, Petri dishes will dry out more quickly. Whereas the, the um, deli containers, well, they'll stay moist a long time. 
But okay. anyway, if they dry out, you have to wet them again mm -hmm. if you want to do um, mixomycetes. Oh, how uh, do you wet them? Do you spray them? Pardon? How do you wet them? Do you spray them with water? Or no, do you... no, I put them in a container uh, with the paper towels on the bottom, two or three layers. I cover them halfway up with water. Oh. And it either, um, I buy bottled water because in case of chlorine in the water might affect it. So I leave it overnight. I pour the water off the next day. So they're still pretty moist and I cover them up and put them somewhere out of the light and then check them every few days or after a while, every few oh. days. Uh, if they dry out, you have to put more water on them. But there's no way to keep fungi from growing. Sometimes they'll just be covered with fungi, other fungi, which I don't, mm -hmm. I can't get mm -hmm. into. And sometimes they don't. Um, you keep them like in some plastic containers? In the plastic containers, like deli containers. Yeah, okay, okay, thank you. I had to do the, that again because it didn't work too good. Yeah, now oh. bark, sometimes um, I've heard that bark will show their um, slime molds very quickly if there's going to be any. Now, if you see uh, a fruiting slime mold, then you let it dry out right away. So you won't, you'll be less likely to get it covered with fungus later. Mm -hmm. But um, I've had to throw a lot away to get covered with the okay. fungi. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, thanks, Virginia. Yeah. Okay. So I see Dave come in. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Hi, Dave. I'm still waking up. I fell asleep. Do you want to wait? <laughs> fell asleep after dinner. But I, I think I sent some things. So yeah, yeah we can look at what I sent in. So here's one that you said you preserved for Alden Dirks. So I guess it's oh, like yeah. gyrometra or something. Gyrometra and Silas. I wasn't sure that's what it was. There's this other thing called gyrometra uh Leucoxanthus, I think, or something close to that. Um but I, I did finally squeeze a few spores out of this thing. And uh, they look like gyromitra and psyllis spores. The, the, the fruit pies also look like gyromitra and psyllis. Now, when you think of gyromitra, you think of false morels and you think what these things that have like stalks and caps and look like morels, but there's a few species that look more like Pizziza really, or um, some people mistake them for auricularium. Um, so they're just these little cups or little flat things. And um, I, I did manage to get a few spores out of this. Um, co coming up, I guess this is immature ass guy. These are Ascomycetes. And let's see. The, I think I think close to the end here, because I I I, I didn't find spore. Ah, there we go. This this I believe might. Yeah, there we go. So that's a gyromitra spore. Beautiful. Yeah, not not bad. It's it's not completely mature. I, I guess I squeezed it out of an ascus when I, I did a smash mount. Um, but on, on the poles, on the two ends, in the, in the photo, it would be the left and the right. Um, there are apiculi, each, each of which is an apiculus. It's a little appendage uh, on the spore. And with gyromitra ancillus, it's it's conical. Now the other one, Charomitra, I think it's Leucoxanthus. Um, the the apiculi are shaped differently. They they look like horns, really, like on each end, like two horns. Um, so this is probably 
very likely Jaron Mitra and Silas. So I preserved them. You know, I, I preserved a few of these. And I'm probably going to go back to this spot and see if I can uh, pick a few more. And maybe I'll get some um, mature ones that'll that'll just drop some some nice spores. Uh, these these can be hard to get spores out of. Do the spores come out of the from the top or from underneath? Excuse me. Do the spores come from the top or from underneath? From the top. Uh, yeah, this, from the top. This, yeah, from the area. top, like like a pizza. Yeah. Okay. Uh, except it's not so much concave. Except this, it's the flat top part, so the flattish top part. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. where the spores come from. Yeah, so, yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, I, those are interesting to find. So for people who are wondering, there's a study going on by um, this guy named Alden Dirks, who's from Pennsylvania. Um, he did our lecture back in January on crust fungi, but he's doing a, a study on this for toxins in these gyromitras, because these things have this very hazy reputation for some people say they're poisonous, some people say they're not, and nobody can seem to come to an agreement about it. So he's looking to collect these things. That's a, it's actually kind of interesting because the toxin that is contained in most gyromitra species, or at least allegedly in most gyromitra species, is highly volatile. And when you dry them out, most of it might very well disappear. So. So the, the mushroom might be toxic when fresh, but um, seeming to be not toxic once it's dried out. So I, I, I will touch base with Alden on, on this eventually, especially after I, I said, send this to him. I'll, I'll send some other things to him also. I'm sure I'll get a few other things this spring that I can include in a package. Ah, Zeramphalina. So all of the field guides will tell you that in the eastern United States, eastern North America, Zeramphalina is going to be either Zeramphalina campanella or Zeramphalina kaufmannii. Uh, but DNA has now shown that there might be at least one cryptic species. And, and this observation that I posted on Mushroom Observer um, looks like I, it, in, in, in the old school way of thinking, it would be Zeramphalina campanella because it was on conifer wood. This was on um, hemlock. Uh, but as, as you'll see here in, in the observation on Mushroom Observer, Alan Rockefeller posted a, a different name. So there, there are there are these uh, cryptic Seramphalina species, I guess one of which is the aptly, aptly named Seramphalina enigmatica, which I don't, I don't know how to identify this. You might need to subject to um, sequencing to know if you have this species as opposed to either Zeramphalina campanella or Kaufmannia. In the old school, old school way of thinking, this is campanella because it was on coniferous wood. They're pretty cool looking. They're little. I like um, that gill shot. Yeah, the gill, that's what I was getting around to saying. The gills are really cool. They are what, what I think intervenous is, is the terminology typically used to describe gills that have veins in between them. So yeah, yeah, they're pretty cool. These are really small. You know, if, if you get one that, that has um, the cap is wider than a penny, that's usually a pretty good size one. So these, these are very small. Typical in the spring, but not only in the spring, you'll find these at any time during the um, warm weather um, mushroom season, spring through fall. 
Dave, Dave. I find them more often in spring, though. Yes. Go ahead, Kate. Uh, I just was curious about the uh, where it enters or comes out of the wood. There's a little uh, furry area. That's very cool. Is that, you know, on Oh, all right of on the bottom of the stalk. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that is significant. That's a good question. Um, you mean the base is like a little disc on the base of the stock? Yeah, I just noticed that myself. Um, Beautiful mushroom, really. Yeah, they're really cool looking. Yeah, they're, they're very photogenic, especially the gills, especially the underside. Mm -hmm. Dave, mm -hmm. I found Cerophalina cauticinalis this fall, the one on the ground on needle debris. Oh, what's the name of that? What what was the Cautici name of that, Marisol? Cauticinalis. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think that one actually looks a little different, doesn't it? Oh, it's my first time. I just... Um, um, yeah, I think that one's kind of a little bit darker, I think. I'm not yellowish, sure. Kind of yellowish. Yellowish. And a little, like, little troop of them on the ground on, on pine needles, my first time. I knew it in oh. the box but I found it this fall in the Pine Barrens. Oh, okay. I don't think I've ever identified that species, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so your next one. Oh, this is interesting. At least 15 years ago, maybe more. When I first moved here um, into this rural sort of property, I plant first. I planted one morel mushroom grow kit. Nothing happened, and then maybe a year or two later, I planted another one, and nothing happened. Well, until now. Um, well, until last year, this this morel came up. Under, under an apple tree. We have several old apple trees on our property. And, and uh, but, but, it, but, but the morel that came up last year, as well as this year, they, they don't look like any of our native species. This, this particular morel looks to me like pretty similar to our native black morel. Now you might find that interesting because it doesn't look black at all. Uh, but as this matures, um, the ridges will darken. And in fact, I, I took another picture today. I, I, I didn't get it up online yet, uh, but it's starting to darken. The ridges are starting to darken like a black morel would. So the thing that's interesting to me is it took like 15 years for this morel mushroom grow kit to produce any sort of of morels and I had totally given up on there anything coming out of it um, until last year I found one and this year one again so I'm wondering you know is is this just from a sclerotia I'm sorry sclerotia that was in the kit where did you get the kits from I, f I forget, I th it may have been fungi perfecti, I'm not sure. I, you know, I looked like, well, last year when I found a mushroom on our property, I went in the attic and I looked for the box and I couldn't find it. So I, so I suppose um, the box has since been recycled. And um, so- Well, I'm does not it mean sure, the demise about, of so, your apple trees? Less, though. Excuse me? Does it mean the demise of your apple tree? I don't know. That's one of the good questions. Um, the particular apple tree where these are growing by, the apples aren't very good. Um, we have several apple trees. They're all different kinds of apple trees. And some of them are pretty good. The apples, that is. This particular apple tree, I, I never gather any of the apples. They, they, they don't taste very good. It's, it's a big apple tree though. So does this mean the demise of the apple tree? Well, if this fungus has become naturalized, 
and is now growing on the roots of the apple tree, perhaps that will help hasten the demise of the tree. It's hard to say. I think probably not real soon, even if that has happened. I, I think probably Marcella that um, associates with, with a live tree probably does so in a more or less symbiotic relationship, at least for a while. But it's a, but that's a really good question. And that's one of the things that I find very interesting here is to, to see if this continues to produce one or two mushrooms on an annual basis from here on in. And if so, um, do are we going to eventually see that the tree starts to um, starts to die? Now, apple trees are funny; they die very slowly. Maybe a, maybe a few branches will die, and then and then the tree is healthy for a few years, and then a few more branches dry, uh, die. So, I, I will be watching over the years. Well, for as long as I am able to watch, I will hopefully keep track of what, what's going on with this tree and, and with these mushrooms. So, That's pretty cool. Yeah, very interesting. That The kit said, I believe, that you can expect mushrooms for one to three years and then pretty much no more after that. So that, that, this is much longer than three years. So, so it is very interesting. So, and, and that is not any kind of native species that, that we find around here. I, 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 I'm pretty darn sure of that. I did submit um, for sequencing some of the one that I found last year. I, I sent to Stephen Russell, uh, but as far as I know, he has not got around to sequencing it. So, so I don't know. Um, that that would be very interesting because I'm I'm really curious. You know, I've I've had other I've known other people who are putting logs in the woods, and then you've got stuff like the uh, the yellow oysters that are becoming. You know, it's like they tend to invade the forest, and so yep. what does that do to the native um, uh, uh, mushrooms that are there? the whole mycological environment. It's, it's a very interesting subject to me. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, so the, um, the yellow oysters, uh, Pleurotus C-I-T-R, <laughs> and after that I forget, and many syllables later, <laughs> you, you get the species name and I forget what it is, but the yellow oysters, Yes, those are now popping up in the wild in uh, the mid-Atlantic and uh, parts of the Midwest. And, and quite a few too, and you're, you're right. Um, it's, not, it's not just an isolated thing where like somebody leaves one log that was inoculated out in the woods. It's, it's, they're popping up quite a bit. So now, now those are saprobes though. The oyster mushrooms are saprobes. So they're, are they supplanting anything native that was there to begin with? Well, maybe hard to say, um, but but Marcella is more of a long-standing thing, a long-standing species or genus, uh, for the most part. Some some are probably mainly saprobic, um, but I had never found any kind of morel around this tree. The only morel I ever found on, on our property uh, were these two that I believe are a result of planting this grow kit about 15 years ago, maybe more. On the other hand, here's Marcella and Justiceps. This is our native species. This is not from, from our property. This is from a, an area where uh, we've been, well, I've, I've been, uh, gathering these black morels now for, wow, I don't know, over 20 years, 20, 24, 25 years, something like that. Um, now this is a black morel. These are black morels. They're just, they're very 
young, immature. But I think I may have also, I wasn't here last week, but Karen came on and I think uh, she may have had a few things to say about these same mushrooms. But the reason why I included this observation was because I updated it and that's coming up here soon. So here we go, you see that one? That, that's from the same exact spot, two, two little patches, same exact location. This is the same species as what you just saw flashing by a little while ago, except this one and the other ones that are subsequent, like those two, these are mature. And I got spores out of these as well, but, but I didn't post the spore shots because I just, uh, I just noticed this morning that there was a print dropped, but but these are the same. These these are black morels. You can see why they're called black morels, and you see here in the first few photos, they don't look like something you would call black because they don't. There's there's no black. Um, and by the way, that other thing that I found on our property, the same section, it's a species in the same section of morchella. But it's but those other ones were not Marcella and Justiceps, at least I don't think so. Hopefully, maybe I can do a little more analysis on that other thing that came up in our yard because it's still out there. I left it there. And I'm I'm gonna try to see what it looks like every day, you know, for the next um, uh, at least the next few days. And oh, well, thanks, so, Dave. Yeah, that's it. That's it for me. You're All welcome. All right. So I have a few things here. Just a couple of odds and ends from my neighborhood here outside of Philadelphia. All right. This is a uh, mayapple rust, Halutus hudophile. So these I find growing on the bottoms of mayapples. You see, these are just the undersides of the May apples. When you look at them a little closer, they, they look like cup fungi, but they're actually not. They're not as, ascos. These are actually basidiers in that whole rust group. And what's the name of that again? This is called um, a lotus podophyllae. I used to see that all the time. Yeah, it's super common. It's, you know, you look at a um, big patch of May apples, and quite often you'll just find, you'll just see, see them. Uh, from the top, you can actually see it's kind of, kind of a rusty color to it where they're fading and they're usually yellowing. This mm -hmm. one looks a little yellow. Um, yeah, when you flip them over, they've got all these little cups underneath of them. So it's a plant path, it's a pathogen. Great picture. Thank you. Oh, well, that's a that's I found this and I photographed it, but I never I didn't ever study it much other than photographing it, and now I'm quite surprised that this is a basidiomycete, not an asco. Yeah. Very now, surprising, really. Yeah, all of, all of these are rust fungi. Not all of them, but a lot of these rust fungi look like ascos, but they definitely. So Sorry. I would say they're definitely basidios. Go uh, ahead, so what were you going to say? Did you see a lot of it? Did you see a lot of it, Luke? Because I've looked, I've seen a lot of mayapple and I only saw one uh, that was infected so far. Uh, there was a, a, a one batch that had buds. They hadn't flowered yet, but uh, I've only seen one. They, they all look really healthy except for that. And and uh, along the same lines, have you seen the spring beauty uh, rust? Oh, yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah, I do. I actually have a picture of that one somewhere. Let's see if I can find that one. Um, yeah, I find this one, the one on the spring beauty and the one on the star of Bethlehem. I find that one a, a lot, lot. And then also on the multi-floor rose, I often see that one too. Oh, I good. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, well, the one on the multi floor route, I didn't put that up because I don't really have that positively identified. There was like two or three things that could be. Let's see what this one is. 
Oh, this thing. I keep, I keep, I keep doing observations of this because I'm saving these for uh, sequencing. This is the Neofabulous Avularis. So I showed one last week. The spring polypore. They really are a cool mushroom. Look how cool those pores are on it. How it goes right down the stipe. The cool stuff. Mm -hmm. Beach. Huh? Like it's I on beach. Yeah, this is on beach. So I've been collecting these. Um, I, I've been collecting every single one that I find of both the white ones and the orange ones um, and getting them sequenced. I don't have any sequences yet because we know we're looking at least two species, but there's probably more than two species in the area. All right. All right, these guys, these are really common in this area. Cereoporus formosus. They're just a cool one. This was a huge log of them. There must have been 30 or 40 of them on this big old tree. I think it was a tulip poplar thing. It had fallen down. They, they love elm. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, they I really like elms. Yeah. Um, and and oh. one time... Um, a guy who used to be in our local club, he's not in the club anymore, but he, um, he made some cold marinated, like pickled, um, squamosis. And he told me that it wasn't even cooked. Now, I don't know, maybe he blanched it. I'm not sure, but it was really good. And I'm not a big fan of this as an edible in general. Um, but these marinated ones marinated in like spice vinegar. Um, were really good. Hmm. I can see that being good. They definitely, they have that kind of farinaceous flavor. I did eat some of these because they were so fresh and so young and I wasn't finding any morels. So I was just taking them and slicing them like super thin and frying them until they were real crispy, putting salt on them. And at that point, they barely tasted like anything except for like a crispy fried, you know, <laughs> okay. chip. What does it mean for the nose, like flour? Yeah, kind of floury. Oh. It's kind of like a cross between like flour and cucumber rind or watermelon rind. Okay. Yeah, watermelon rind. Watermelon yeah, rind. That's what they really, really taste like. Watermelon rind. <laughs> but look it's at the like look at the pour look at the pores on this one though. Look how it goes down the stipe. That's a really mm, beautiful. Kind of so beautiful. these are coming out already, Luke. Yeah. 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 This was two okay, or three days ago. Some, we saw some too, and there was all this gutation. I had never seen it like with these huge drops underneath, just like uh, uh, my friend took a bunch of pictures and posted them, but uh, I was surprised. I didn't know they guttated. <laughs> All right, and I got this one. Oh, wait, I already, we already looked at that one, didn't we? Oh. I put this one on twice. Oh, no, I didn't. I just went backwards. I found this. I thought, I just, I thought this was, I got a kick out of finding this. I found this yesterday, this purple sport puffball, Calvatia cyanthiformis, obviously from last year. But I just didn't expect to see this this time of the year. Like, I thought it would have been gone after the winter, like totally destroyed. But this thing was actually still really pretty solid. You mean even with the spores or just the cap that is left? You know, I didn't see anything puffing out of this when I ripped it in half. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that the sterile base? It stays. I have one that is so old and I'm still looking good. Yeah, isn't that funny? It's like a cup and it's a spongy. Yep. You suppose it fruited late in the season and then maybe kind of froze? Never matured? No, no. They have a very thick and big steady base left. Oh, you think that's just the bottom? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the spore mass goes away with the rain and wind and they leave like a kind of a cup. Like an ice cream cup type of shape. Can you tell at this stage 
the difference between sciatiformis and craniiformis? Yeah, the color. The color. Yeah, well, because the a, color is the spores, purple. right? It has a purplish tint. I called this um, the purple spored one just because it looked like it was already stained. So maybe, I don't know. I, I just kind of. If I have a chance at the end, I can show you my observation in, in I Naturalist to write what I mean when I'm trying to tell about that base that is left. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then let me just go to. Um... I just loaded this in real quick. So I only had one picture of it. This is the spring beauty rust, but this picture came out pretty good. So this is related to that thing that we were just looking at on the uh, may apple. Um, this is actually in a different genus though, Puccinia. That may apple rust was in Puccinia, but it was moved, I think somewhat recently in the past few years to its own genus. Um, Puccinia is like a huge genus of rust. So I feel like they're slowly moving stuff out of there. But you can see it looks pretty similar. So this is a spring beauty. It looks like an octopus arm. Yeah. <laughs> and wow, there, excellent, excellent there are some Types of Puccinia and the name of the species depends on the host. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's so why this is called Marii Wilsonii, because this is a Clatonia Wilsonii. Is that right? I don't know. But yeah, you're right. They're very host dependent and oftentimes their name has to do with the plant host. So unfortunately, this little spring beauty is not, <laughs> it's, it's not doing very well. And no. took its toll. And us sicko mycophiles, we see the plant being destroyed by a pathogen. We're like, ooh, look at that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's everything I have. So um, I'm gonna share Audrey's. Um, Audrey emailed this to me, then we'll get to Lila and um, Bianca. I'll be done sharing my screen. Are you there, Audrey? I'm not sure if Audrey's still there or not. If you are, you're muted, Audrey. She just sent me these photographs of these ink caps. Hi, yeah, I'm here. Oh, yep. hello. <laughs> <laughs> They're from the Wissahickon um, in Philadelphia, so they were just growing a little right next to the, the trail, and that, that was one clump of them, and there were multiples in various stages of maturity um, in, that, in that little area there. So yeah, I just saw them today, so I thought I'd share. Cool. Hmm. I wonder what they are. Do you think they're not mica caps? Yeah, those, those are those are probably mica caps. With Just old the, ones. With the the caps probably got rained on. Right, they they lose all that uh, glistening stuff when it rains. Yeah, they... more, more than one species though of mica cap. Yeah. Uh, Coprinellus section mycaceus. There's at least two species. They're really really hard to tell apart. I'm not even sure anybody really knows how. They say that the um, shape of the spores, it, it depends on whether the spores are um, elliptical or um, I think it's called mitronoid or um, uh, shaped like a miter, like a bishop's hat. Uh, but it depends on the way the spores are, are aligned also. I mean, the, the same spore can look like a miter or just an, an ellipse depending upon the way it's just positioned. So I, I find this distinction to be somewhat um, uh, dubious in terms of telling the species, but DNA has supported the idea of at least two species in 
Copernellus section Mysaceus, and um, they're they're pretty common in the spring, and you find them almost any time. But spring yeah. is when we mainly find them. I guess is when I I usually see them. Yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Audrey. Dried up a little, and a little weather to me. They were quite dry. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, Lila. Do you want to go next? Sure. Okay, so here we have a Poziza. I'm not finding much uh, fresh, but I did find this in some wood chips. And I think it's um, Varia, which used to be called Rapanda, maybe. Yeah, that's what I usually find early on. Um, with Poziza, you almost need to scope the spores just to just to like eliminate some of the possible species. But early on, these sort of yellowish ones, uh, usually on woody debris, are what used to be called a rapanda for the most part. Now it's been lumped into the, the concept precise of varia. Uh, that's probably what those are. I, I find them in morel season, I find them. Yeah, I think it, I just read briefly on Michael Kuh's Kuh's key and read briefly about it. And it said that it has a, a layered structure and I happened to break one in half, in, in half and you can sort of see the uh, like five different layers comprising it. So it's, Oh yeah, that's a good photo. Yeah, you can see in the context, you can yeah. see the layers. Yeah, very good. So that was kind of interesting. All right. And then, as I said, I'm finding old stuff. So here's something that I thought you guys might think was interesting. I think this is a old, large heresium. I think it fell out of a, a a beech tree. There, had, there were two beech trees, one dead and one living. And the living one had a had a spot where this it looked like this might have come out. But down here is uh, where I think it was attached. And here's all the dried up teeth. That's pretty neat. If it wintered over like that, yeah, they yeah, it disintegrate. I know. I was stunned. I've, you know, it's like, is that a dead animal there? And it's like, not with that stem on it. So. Uh, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I didn't think Herisium would do that. They're, Me they're either, but cool. that definitely looks like it. It's got the same yeah. like, pattern of growth and all that. Yeah. Or, yeah, beach, beach. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, it's pretty darn big. I wish I found it when it was fresh. But yeah, so that's what I'm guessing that is. Lots, lots of beach around oak. But, uh, different. And then I, I had some other stuff. Yeah, Luke, you shared similar things. The um, Stereoporus, and I guess that was the only other fresh thing that I found, but everything else is, is old and dry still. We need more rain. All right, cool. Thanks, Father. Welcome. Okay, I think Bianca was next. Sure, I tried looking for more mushrooms, but I didn't find any except for older ones today. So I'm just going to follow up on the one from last week. Um, let's see if I can find it real quick. Oops, wrong one. I'll just show my Facebook post. Uh, there we go. Can you see this? Yes. All right. So 
here was the picture of the mushroom. Had that nice blue jean color with white underneath, white pores. And uh, heterobasidian irregulare was the suggestion. Okay. That's what Marisol said last week, so. There we go. Good job, Marisol. And that's it, thank that's, you. That's weird, I've never seen one blue like that before. Cool. It is cool. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's the end of everyone that said they had something. So anybody else? We have like 12 more minutes left. Anybody else have anything they want to share? Luke, can I show that purple puffball? Yeah, yeah go for it. All right, let me try to, to share the this thing. One sec. Share. Oh, geez. One second. Okay, give me one minute. One minute. One second. One second. So then I gotta go to I naturalist. Then I'll be all set. Naturalist. All right. So then I go back to the Zoom thing. Oi. How I go back? Oh, geez. Oh, I see. Expand. I'm getting there. Sorry, give me some minute. Okay, now it shared screen. And I go to iNaturalist. And what's the name of the Calvatia siatiformis? Siatiformis. Mm -hmm. Siati. Oh, how did you spell it? <gasps> it's because I wrote the whole thing wrong. I'm so sorry, sorry. Calvatia siatiformis. I got it. All right, I got two examples of what I was trying to tell you. This one, it was a monster that I found in my neighborhood. It's like if two of them were growing together. And here is when the spores are being released on the right. Oh, it went forward. Oh, geez, how do I get out? Oh, no. Okay. X out. Yeah, I, I did. Oh, but I didn't, maybe I only have one photo. Oh, maybe it's on the other one. Okay, just give me one chance. Here, I found this in front of my house and look at this spore print on the grass. And this is what I was trying to tell you. This is the infertile spongy base. It stays for months. If you don't step on it, if you step on it, you will flatten it like a like foam. Kind of. So, so I guess the sterile base uh, uh -huh. covered by the spores actually is is what I'm guessing. This is like washed, but it still has the magenta purplish tone. I still have one here. It's it's few years old and still has that. Now it's like gray purplish. One of those that I saved, and I got one more. Let's see one more. Oh, this one, I got it when I saw it for the first time. Oh man, I don't have the cap. Yep, didn't, it was much shooting and then it was purple. I'm surprised that I didn't put all the photos because I got so many, but I didn't do it. All right, that's good enough. Stop share, all right. Luke, are you planning to continue this uh, through the summer, even if you go on physical forays? Luke, Luke must have disappeared. We lost him. <laughs> Luke. Sorry, I was I muted myself because my daughter was talking to me. <laughs> oh, okay. She was trying to feed me ice cream, but I didn't. I refused. <laughs> sure, I would. I have to get I have to get in four race shape. <laughs> anyway, I yeah, Susan, uh, I think so for sure. I think right, this is a good. You, 
so even if you go on forays, you'll still on Tuesday sort of look at whatever else anybody found or review maybe what was found on the foray? Yeah, I would like to. I mean, I think it's a good way to, you know, just to do taxonomy stuff together. And I'm learning a lot. Yeah, me too. I love it. I love it. And because people find so many before. different things. Yeah. We've always, we've always said, as long as I've been a member of the club, that we've never really had a strong taxonomy group, like while I've been in the club, because, because the excuses, and it's a valid excuse, is that everyone lives all over the place in New Jersey. If you have to drive, you know, two hours to get to a taxonomy meeting on a weeknight, I mean, who can do that? So. We used to have it on our kitchen t uh, table about 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, I know. I mean, I've, I've heard that, but that's. Monday night, was it? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I feel like this is a, uh, Zoom has been a blessing for uh, <laughs> the taxonomy thing. So anyway, yeah, I would definitely like to keep going. Well, there's no way I can probably even get to a foray unless I, you know, uh, well, so it would be fun for me to be able to still connect with you folks. Yeah, number. yeah we're going to keep it going. Good. Okay. I'm clapping for all of us. All right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so I do want to, before we go, um, just briefly um, re-announce and remind everyone this Friday, um, we do have a lecture with James Scott, Dr. James Scott from um, the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. Um, so he's doing a lecture on mycoparasitism when good fungi turn bad. So he says there's many examples of fungi that use other fungi as a source of nutrition. Um, so like that, um, that one that um, Marisol was showing, that orange thing on the polypore. So he's doing a lecture on that this Friday at seven o'clock. I sent the link out on Monday. So hopefully everyone can join that. And then I guess we'll see everybody either on Friday or next Tuesday, right? Yay. All right. Thank you, Luke, for everything you do. Oh, well, you're yes. welcome. Well, thanks everyone for joining tonight. And all right, thanks, Luke. Have a great night, everyone. See you all next all right, week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Luke. Bye-bye.